And that's happening now. So I will start admitting people. We can, of course, wait a few minutes. Yep. I have a big lawnmower going outside. I hope it goes away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can't hear it, so that's fine. That's good. Hello, hello, welcome everybody. Good evening, hello Vicky, see you waving. Hello Desmond, Suzanne, hello, good evening. That's great when you can put your videos on, we can see you. Hello, let's admit Eric. We have about 30 people registered for this uh, recording today with Eric Maisel. So please do use the chat box uh, to say hello, who you are, where you're from, so Eric knows who he's talking to. That would be very helpful, thank you. And I always share the chat box um, with Eric afterwards. So any questions, any messages that uh, get missed, he will be able to deal with them afterwards. I'm in rainy Spain. It's not often I say that. Normally it's sunny Spain. We've just had six months of rain in the last couple of weeks. Lots of red rain as well from the Sahara Desert. So everywhere's very muddy. Mm. We, we could use that here in California. Yeah, I bet. Okay, so we've got Cyprus, we've got the UK, we've got Spain, we've got Dublin, Wales, Canada, great, lots and lots of people. So we'll just give it another minute or two before I hit the record button and introduce you. Waiting room, let Cleo in. So I don't know how many of you are on this whole series with Eric, but this is two of six. So um, if you didn't catch the first one, it's on our blog. So don't worry, you haven't missed anything. Hello, Lydia, just in time. Well done. Nefelia, Susie, Vicky, welcome everybody. Lots of familiar faces, that's great. Okay, I think uh, we'll start on time as usual, Eric. And um, I'll just hit the record button. Hello and hello and welcome everybody. My name is Dawn Campbell. I'm your IAPCNM host, and I'm joined by Eric Maisel. Welcome, Eric. Hello, Dawn. Great to be with you. You're very welcome. Lovely to have you as always. And welcome to all of you lovely people from around the world who are tuned in to, for two of six um uh, masterclasses that Eric has very kindly put together for us so that we better understand ourselves and are better able to help our clients understand themselves. So because it's a series, I'm not going to waste any of our precious time together regurgitating uh, an introduction. You've all read the um, biography of Eric, but needless to say, he's probably the most sought after creativity coach uh, maybe in the whole world, I don't know, but certainly in the States and the most prolific author that I've ever come across and I've read quite a few of his books and uh, he writes right across all genres as well as being a prolific blogger so 
a man of words, plenty to say. So um, I'm going to hand over to you, Eric, and let's get started. Thank you, Don. Lovely to be with all of you. Wish I were in Europe. Wish I were traveling again, but you know, not quite yet. But maybe I'll get there. So what we're looking at over this series are ways of thinking about the current mental disorder model, the psychiatric model, and its flaws and alternatives to that model. That model, as you know, is embodied in the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. That's the American version. It's also embodied in the ICD, International Classification of Diseases, which Europe tends to use. And they both promulgate the same ideas. And it's a very bizarre idea, if you think about it. The idea is you're normal, unless you have a mental disorder. And once the mental disorder is treated, you're normal again, whatever that means. We've lost personality as an idea in psychology. We all know that Aunt Jane and Uncle Bob are personalities. They have personalities. They are different from your cousin Jim and your mom and your dad. Human beings have personalities. We are different. There's no such thing as normal. And adding on a mental disorder doesn't suddenly make normal an interesting idea. So what we're talking about today is personality, sort of returning to the theme of personality as something of interest to us. And my little model of personality that I wanna share with you, which I think is both robust and interesting and useful. So let me begin. As I said, we've lost the word personality, maybe because it was meant to stand for so much that is everything that is human. Maybe we needed to reduce our vision so as to have some operative words and so we lost personality, but it's still a powerful and useful word. If you were lucky enough somewhere in your school to take that class that used to be called Theories of Personality, that would probably have been one of your most interesting classes because there, are, there have been many interesting theories of personality. Now, none of them were real theories in a scientific sense. For a theory to be a theory in a scientific sense, it needs to be what's called falsifiable. That is, if there's data that runs counter to the theory, that data has to be taken into account. To give you a simple example, if you believe that the Earth is flat and you send up a satellite and you see that the Earth is round, you change your theory. That information that you got from the satellite is meaningful. With these so-called theories of personality, there was nothing like sending up a satellite and getting information. These were just distinct and discrete ideas or opinions, but very interesting ones. The one probably most known to Europeans would have been Freudian theory, now 125 years old. And that was a developmental model. Freud believed we developed through stages that some of you remember oral, anal, genital, those ideas of moving through stages. And that disorder occurred when you got stuck in a stage. That was his model. Among other pieces of the model, he also had the tripartite consciousness model of id, ego, and superego. So there are many interesting things about Freudian theory. But the most interesting thing was that it was a developmental model as opposed to Jungian theory. Jung had the idea that we undevelop, that we start whole, that we're a perfect little human being when we're born, exactly right, so to speak. And then over time, we lose parts of ourselves until we hit what he called the midlife crisis when we discover that we are so far from who we ought to be that we can't quite stand it. Very different model. 
can't be reconciled. The two models can't be reconciled. They're not really theories because they can't be reconciled, but they're very interesting. And of course, there have been interesting other theories. Adlerian theory had to do with complexes, superiority complexes, inferiority complexes, interesting psychological ideas. Personality trait theory, which was an American construct from a guy named Kelly, was the idea that we're made up of different personality traits and you could work on any personality trait and affect the whole system. It was a systems theory kind of idea. So you could work on confidence or risk taking or any personality trait you could name. You could work on that with a client and you would be helping the whole client by virtue of working on that trait. We all know Maslow's theory, hierarchy of needs, um, seems very relevant. If your country is bombed, suddenly your hierarchy of needs changes, clearly. Most people, most helpers, without quite knowing it, are, are doing some version of social cognitive theory. That is, they're hearing what their clients are saying and maybe inviting their clients to say other things, to change their thinking, to better think thoughts that serve them. I think most helpers, in one way or another, are doing a version of cognitive therapy or cognitive theory, etc. So the headline here is that there have been many theories of personality, really opinions about personality, many of which are very interesting and still relevant. It's hard to cherry pick the best ideas out of these theories because, for instance, Freudian theory has 100 volumes. How to pick the best three ideas, the three nuggets from Freudian theory, not an easy job, but there are many interesting ideas in Freudian theory, especially his notions of the defenses, which we still think is really a valuable idea. We know that human beings are defensive and that affects our work with them. So there have been many theories of personality. None of them true, all of them interesting, but none of them true. We are too complicated for there to be a true theory of personality. And kind of most importantly, have any of them been actually useful in your work with clients? Cognitive theory, I think, has been useful. Identifying what clients say and helping them think thoughts that serve them is useful. I think humanistic theory has been helpful, that is, People really do want to, many people really do want to create and uphold humanistic values. And if they're not upholding humanistic values, they're not really happy with their lives or proud of themselves. So there have been bits and pieces from these various theories that have been useful, but by and large, something like Freudian theory or Jungian theory has not been actually useful in session. So I, over the years, have been trying to come up with a model that is more functional, more useful in session, and also, I think, truer. So this is the simple model that I'm selling, that personality is made up of these three parts, original personality, that is, who we are when we come into the world, because we're already somebody. Anybody who's had kittens or, or puppies or kids knows that every creature comes into the world itself already. Twins are different. Our twin granddaughters are different, one from the other. Then over time, we become ourselves, so to speak. That's our formed personality. We kind of stiffen into the person we are, the recognizable, repetitive person we are. And from my point of view, that form personality is always going to be a bit in conflict with original personality for reasons that we'll chat about. But there is a natural dynamism and conflict between who we came into the world being and who we became. 
And then the third idea is the idea of available personality. That's our remaining freedom to be the person we want to be, our remaining freedom to make change. If there were no available personality, we'd be stuck with form personality, wouldn't we? There wouldn't be any idea like free will. We would just be stuck being formed. But that's not quite the way we are. We are formed, but we have available personality available. And I see that as kind of an amount. That is, we have more available personality available sometimes than other times. For instance, if you're an addict running around town looking for heroin, you don't have a lot of available personality available. You're busy with your form personality looking for a fix. But the second you enter recovery, that amazing thing that human beings can do, where they say, I'm stopping, suddenly you have much more personality available. Not 100%, but more. And I think that if you just picture that one day to the next day from still running around town looking for heroin to the day you enter recovery, I think you can sense how much available personality has been reclaimed overnight, so to speak. I think it's completely possible to share this model with clients, to say it. Clients, I think, find it interesting and useful. I have it here as a simple paragraph. You came into the world already, you with an original personality. Then life happened, you started to stiffen. But as stiff as you become, became, you still have freedom to be the person you want to be. Very simple to say. And it really honors a person's original nature, which they have not been chatted about with in any setting. Yes, short and sweet. I like to give myself a round of applause occasionally. Why not? So simple to use with clients, you present it, <laughs> you let it sink in for a moment, and then you might ask a question. And so we're going to look at some of the kinds of valuable questions that you might ask clients with respect to this model. And as I say here, if you invite clients to journal, which you might like to do, these questions become journal prompts. If you have an arsenal of tools that you use with clients, journaling, of course, can be one of them. I have, by the way, two books out recently on journaling in the therapeutic arena. One is called Transformational Journaling for Coaches that came out a few months ago. And coming out in about a month is a book called The Great Book of Journaling. So if Using journaling in session is interesting to you. Take a peek at those books. Also, if you use visualizations with clients, I just want to recommend a book of mine that just came out called Redesign Your Mind, which has 50 or 100 interesting visualizations that help clients redesign their mind, helps them think of their mind as a room that they can redecorate and redesign. So back to the main line, the questions you might ask. You don't have to give people a lot of instructions. They will get this question. What aspect of your original personality is still challenging you? L let me just run through for a second how this might look in an actual human being. That is how original personality might play itself out and remain a challenge. One aspect of original personality is intelligence, right? People come into the world somewhere along some spectrum or continuum of intelligence. Forget about what intelligence tests actually test. We know there are lots of problems with the idea of intelligence. In fact, intelligence almost doesn't sound politically correct to talk about, but intelligence does 
spread out over a continuum. And if you were born smart, whatever smart means, we won't try to deconstruct it, but whatever smart means, if you were born smart, and in your family it was not okay to be smart, or in your culture it was not okay to be smart, then you're gonna have a lifelong tension of being not as smart as you know you are. You're gonna be not quite able to do the things you think, you, you not quite able to write that book you think you ought to be able to write because you're smart enough to write that book, but why aren't you smart enough to write that book? Because that smartness has been injured. Your formed personality has a reduced version of your original personality smartness. I think this is the truth about how we travel through life as we come into the world, let's say smart, and then we always have trouble manifesting that smartness because of society's dictates and other reasons, our own anxieties, our own resistance to being smart, etc. So there's natural dynamism here that the DSM can't possibly capture. Where you may end up with is something the DSM wants to call depression, but it has nothing to do with depression. It has to do with this conflict between your original smartness and your ability now to get your work done. That's just one example. You might come into the world with an original personality that's on the sad side. Well, then you're going to have a lifetime case of the blues, a background coloration of sadness. You're going to be one of those world, one of those five-year-olds who's already world weary, who already, who's already sensitive and sees sees pain around her and reacts to that pain and all of that. So you will be dealing with that your whole life long. And with respect, with, with respect to original personality, you could ask about any particular trait that you feel is up for your client or just invite your client to think about, well, original person, you can think of original personality as being made up of many traits. And let's look at one or another of these. I think a very interesting one, a super interesting one is energy. never talked about in psychology or psychiatry, except of course, as mania or bipolar disorder, which is, is kind of a mockery of energy. But human beings come into the world more or less energetic with more or less chi, as the Chinese say, more or less life force. If you come into the world with high energy, what's going to happen? ADHD label coming, right? I'm just pausing for effect because something like ADHD has nothing to do with being a mental disorder. It has all, everything to do with coming into the world a lot, with lots of energy that you can't contain when you're sitting in school or sitting in church or sitting at the dinner table you are just bouncing off walls. You have too much energy to listen to the sermon. So you're gonna get into trouble. Of course, you're gonna have no trouble with your energy if you're interested in something. You're gonna play your video game for three hours straight. Right, you have no attention deficit where things interest you. You're only gonna have an attention deficit where things don't interest you. I think inviting people to think about energy and what it's like to send your own brain racing, which we do. If you're a smart person, you invite your brain to think about things and then you send it racing, but then you have to be the engineer on that train and the brakeman on that train so that you don't go off into so-called mania. This is a different way of thinking about something like energy from bipolar disorder or mania. 
And with any one of these traits, openness, anxiety, what if you come into the world? We know that one of, one of the tests that infants get is the startle reflex. Some infants startle more easily than other infants. They're the ones who are gonna cry more during the night, have more colic, etc. cetera. In the, in the developmental field, that's called temperament as opposed to personality. That is, children are born with a temperament, so-called temperament. Some kids are gonna be born more anxious than other kids, aren't they? Not necessarily. Anxiety is gonna spread over a continuum just as intelligence spreads or sadness spreads. So you can invite a client to think about is, is, is higher anxiety a feature of your original personality? That's not a slur, that just becomes a lifelong challenge. You're gonna feel a little more unsafe in life, aren't you? If you came into the world more easily startled. These are just, I think, logical connections that you and your client can easily make. And of course I have down here sexual orientation as a feature of original personality. I think it goes without saying what difficulties a client is going to have if he or she never gets to manifest her, her true sexual orientation. If she's forced by family or culture or other strictures to be someone she isn't. I think that's a very clear example of original personality butting heads against form personality. Where you end up in the closet, where your form personality is a closeted, closeted personality. Okay, just chatted about that. I like these uh, slides with people flying over mountains. Many of these features of original personality are going to become mental disorder labels for your clients. And your clients, because they're not taught better, because they're not informed, are going to believe that they have these things, that they, that they have ADD. So by chatting about this model and by refusing to use the labels they use, that is by not parroting back the labels, you help them move away from mental disorder thinking, mental disorder labeling and chemicals. You help them move away from the chemicals that they are probably taking. So many people, including so many kids are now on psychiatric medications. This model helps your clients move away from the mental disorder paradigm and chemicals. You're doing them a big favor by introducing this kind of personality model. You don't have to flat out say, there's no such thing as a mental disorder. You've been sold a bill of goods. You don't have to, you don't have to go down that anti-psychiatry line if you don't want to. But just by virtue of presenting this model, you're helping people move away from the mental disorder paradigm. This is a huge one, isn't it? Just think about it. If a feature of your original personality is a big appetite, you're gonna be ambitious, maybe a little grandiose, maybe a little narcissistic and maybe put on 30 or 40 extra pounds. All as a feature of having a big appetite which is connected to life energy and chi. Appetite's a wonderful thing. If we don't have appetite, we die. Failure to thrive in, 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 in infants is lack of appetite for life, giving up on life. So, Appetite is wonderful, 
comma, and then we have the lifelong challenge of dealing with our own large appetites. And by talking this way about the amazing wonderfulness of large appetites, we suddenly get a reframe for addictions and eating disorders and other places where appetites get out of control. We don't have to go down the disease model of addiction as if you caught, caught the eating too much flu. It's that you have appetites. And one of the ways we soothe ourselves when we have a big appetite is to, and there it is right in front of us. That's probably about 2,200 calories right there. And it's useful to make this distinction between, of course, there are things that are causing you to despair now, world circumstances, COVID, your life, relationship issues, work issues, all of that. Plus, let's try to tease out any original sadness. Because even if everything were so to speak perfect, which is an absurd idea, you might still be that person who's carrying around this heavy overcoat. And I use that kind of language, that kind of metaphoric language. Maybe there's a way we can help you remove that heavy overcoat. That's part of your original personality. That's one of the visualizations in, Redesign your, in my book, Redesign Your Mind, is that removing that heavy overcoat. And this work around original sadness can become a reframe for depression. As you know, folks have lost a whole vocabulary around sadness that we all used to have. Sadness, despair, disappointment, unhappiness. We used to have normal words for how we were feeling. And that all has gotten glommed into, conglomerated into the word depression, which really needs to be deconstructed. Another example, just continuing our thread here. And these are questions you can invite clients to think about. They, they do a great job of running with these questions. Jane, you know, if you came into the world a little more anxious than the next person, how has that played itself out? And Jane will have lots to tell you about how, the, how that's played itself out. And so if you're working with a client around any kind of anxiety disorder, I work with lots of clients around performance anxiety because I work with creative and performing artists. This becomes a reframe for performance anxiety. That is, this may be a feature of your original personality. So we're gonna need lots of, there's no way we're gonna get rid of it. Forget about getting rid of it. You're not gonna get rid of it any better than Pavarotti did or Carly Simon did or Laurence Olivier did. They had to live with it, with their performance anxiety. You're gonna to have to live with yours because it's a feature. It may be a feature of your original personality. So we're gonna need tactics and strategies, aren't we? Our goal is not to cure it or treat it, it's to manage it. So those were questions to invite clients to think about with regard to original personality. Now let's look at some questions that connect to the idea of formed personality. And this is the core question. You're essentially asking your client to do memoir here or try to understand her life story. But this is a different way of asking that what's your life been about question. And that is, can you tell me a little bit about your formed personality? And clients get that tension between 
form personality and original personality in the way that the questions create it. They think more deeply about who they are by virtue of them bouncing form personality off of original personality. Simple, straightforward question to ask, and a lovely one. What aspect of your form personality would you like to change? And that like to change phrase reinforces, sells them on the idea that they have available personality, available for this kind of change. We're in the business of presuming that our clients can change. If there were only formed personality, they couldn't. So we're believing that they have available personality and we're cheerleading for available personality. We're cheerleading, cheerleading for their ability to change. And this simple question does a lot of good work. It invites them to think about their form personality and invites them to believe that they have available personality at hand. And so many things go into form personality. I could have made this chart 75 million squares, all the, all the different things that go into making us who we are over time. But you might want to isolate one or another of these in your work with a client because it's come up. For me, there's, there's one over to the right, criticism, which comes up for my creative and performing artist clients all the time. The way in which they got criticized in third grade by their third grade teacher, and that somehow caused them not to write their novel now or criticized by family members, by parents. So there are lots of different aspects of form personality that you can identify, isolate, and work on. The only other one I think I'll mention here before going on in addition to criticism is the bullying one. Just about every client has been bullied in life because, and this will be a long sentence, but one of the areas that I write in is the, area, is the area of the authoritarian personality, which is a construct that sociologists and psychologists at the University of California at Berkeley put together in the 1950s in the aftermath of World War II. They wanted to know who Hitler's followers were. They were trying to figure out why so many Germans followed Hitler. And so they studied that and looked at two, two groups of people, authoritarian leaders and authoritarian followers, and tried to figure out characteristics that distinguished those different groups. What they never, because they were interested in, in social issues and political issues, they never looked at family issues. They never looked at authoritarian personalities in the family which is something I've looked at over the years and written books about. And pundits, we just make up these numbers because nobody knows, but pundits who write in the field of authoritarians in the family claim that 25% of people are authoritarian by nature or by formed personality, which means that just about everybody has had an authoritarian personality in his or her family to deal with. Father, mother, sister, brother, uncle, grandparent, who has been bullying by nature. And more than bullying, cruel. One of the features of the authoritarian personality is cruelty and a need to punish. So it's completely likely that your, your client has faced cruel treatment and has been punished in her lifetime. Obviously we're in the area of trauma-informed care and, and things that you know about, but I just wanna connect up this idea of bullying and authoritarian personalities in the family with this idea of formed personality. 
and, and why we become the people we become, why we're sort of unrecognizable to ourselves, why we now bully or why we enter into relationships we know are not okay with bullying people, etc. So I'm saying a lot here all at once, but the shorthand here is by having as a reference frame formed personality, you can then look at any particular aspect of what formed the person and isolate that and work in that area. And this is a high order question. It asks for a lot of thinking on your client's part, but they're eager to think about these things. They're eager to think about how their natural intelligence has hit the wall of social injunction and familial injunction and why they're not as smart as they might have been if circumstances hadn't reduced their smartness, so to speak. They can run with this kind of question and do interesting thinking for themselves. And now we're on available personality. Or to say it differently, your client's remaining freedom to be the person she wants to be. I'm just pausing because as you know, so much of existential therapy, existential coaching circles around this idea of freedom and personal responsibility. These ideas of freedom and personal responsibility. And that's what you're demanding of your client, so to speak. You're demanding that she take responsibility for her life. We don't believe in just insight. There's that old dictum after insight comes work that a client learned something in session is not enough. Now she's got to go do the work. And she can only do the work because she has some remaining freedom to do the work. If she had no remaining freedom to do the work, she couldn't do the work. So we're positing this freedom. We need it to be there and we're positing it. So you can ask a question like this, which is kind of an amount question. And just let your, let your client think about this kind of question. How much available personality do you have right now? And where they'll go immediately is, well, I would have more if I did X. I would have more if I had that hard conversation with my mate and told him to stop doing what he's doing. I know that if I had that conversation, I'd be a freer person, I'd be a bigger person, I'd be more myself if I could have that conversation. And this is one of those key questions that we, however, whatever language we use, this is one of those key questions we ask clients, how can you be freer? What's the path? What do you want to try? What experiment can we run to see if it garners you more available personality? And we want freedom to be a big word for clients. So we want the clients, so we want them to think about different senses where they are free and where they aren't free. For instance, they may be free to say something to their girlfriends, but not free to say that same thing to their mate. Simple idea, but it gives them a sense of where they are free and where they aren't free. And if they want more available freedom, where they can go for it, namely to their girlfriends. I mean, very simple idea, but if you are stuck not feeling free and you know that I'm not free here, but I am free over there. Well, go over there more often. So these are just some ways of introducing the idea of these personalities in session. So a client starts using 
mental disorder labeling stuff. You know, I'm ADD and that's why I can't sit still and write my novel. So I would reframe that and present my little three piece model and say, you know, maybe it has nothing to do with the thing you're calling ADD. Maybe what's troubling you, what's making it difficult for you to sit still is the high energy that you came into the world with, a feature of your original personality. Let's look at that for a moment. You can see that in just a sentence or two, I can, I can move a client from, from the mental disorder model universe to this personality oriented universe. Again, just another reframe of a way of saying all three things in a sentence or two. <coughs> so I think we're approaching a summary. I can I get a sense from this slide <laughs> that we're probably uh, reaching the end of this little chat. And of course, I'd love to take questions after we're done if there are questions. But the main thing I want to leave you with is that this, this, I think this model is actually true, true in the sense that it captures a lot about personality, not everything. No, so to speak, theory of personality can capture everything. But I think it captures many interesting things. But most importantly, clients get a lot from hearing about it. It's useful. I believe it's very, very easy to present and clients instantly get it take it away, run with it, and find it useful. So that's really why I'm selling it to you today is not as an intellectual construct, not as something that's abstractly interesting, but as a real tool in your toolkit that you can provide clients with this idea of three personalities. You don't have to say a lot, just let them hear about it and then let them run with it. So these are some ways you can work in session with clients. I find these all interesting and useful. If you, if you may remember from Gestalt work where there'd be two chairs and a client would move from one chair to the other chair, sort of interrogating herself, different parts of her personality. She'd be one part of her personality in one chair and another part of her personality in the other chair and she'd move back and forth. It's a very powerful technique out of Gestalt. And this is, and the first one is like that. It's a very powerful way of a having a client chat with herself about what's going on. Let me just jump to three. If you like me, like clients to set goals for themselves so that you at the end of a session know what your client's attempting to accomplish over the next week or month, then this becomes a place of natural goal setting. Namely, what do you think you'd like to try over the next month to increase your available personality? What do you wanna try? So this becomes a way to connect up these three personalities with the idea of setting goals. And just the last one, easy idea. You're helping clients do two things at once. You're helping them honor how trapped they are in their own personality, their form personality, how stiff that is, comma, and that they have freedom to change. I think we want to honor both because if we act like change is easy, well, clients don't believe that well, let's snap our fingers and next week you can stop using heroin. We don't believe that. But by the same token, we don't believe that people have to live the way they are living for all time. We do believe that they have executive functioning, that they have a ways of talking to themselves, that they can acquire more self-awareness, et cetera. All of that's aspects of available personality. 
So by presenting these two sides of the coin, yes, you're stuck, but you can get unstuck. We honor their reality and we give them a way of thinking about how they can move forward. So this is a little summary. By presenting this model to clients, we give them a new understanding of personality and a new sense of personality. Remember, personality is a word that's kind of gone from our vocabulary. Now it's about mental health, mental disorder, disorders, normal, abnormal, but not personality. I think it provides, as I just mentioned, a framework for homework assignments, goal setting, useful things for clients to do out of session. It naturally and assiduously avoids mental disorder language and thinking. I th I'm always subtly moving clients away from believing they have ADHD or ODD or ADD or whatever. I take that as part of my work to be subtly, sometimes overtly and sometimes subtly moving them away from that kind of language and thinking because I don't believe it actually serves them. I think it does a nice job of simplifying the complexities of personality without oversimplifying. I don't think it's a too simple model. As I mentioned before, I think one of the great ideas out of Freudian psychology, and as you probably know, Anna Freud, Sigmund's daughter, ran with this idea because she found it most interesting of her dad's ideas, and that's the ideas of defensiveness. Our clients are defensive. And I think we can reframe their defensiveness as the ways that they've engaged in to protect their foreign personality. It helps explain resistance to us. We can stop sort of bad mouthing our clients in our own mind. Oh, our client's so resistant. The better we understand how stiff formed personality is, the more we can be compassionate about our clients' difficulties in making a change or making any movement. That's one of the things I like about the idea of formed personality is that it really honors how difficult, how stuck people get. Not stuck for all times, they have available personality, but how stuck people get. Avoiding moral judgments, we know to do that. And we know that we understand, I think you've gotten that this model helps support some really useful self-inquiry and some increased self-awareness. And one of the important things in coaching and therapy, as you know, is to have a shared language with your clients that you, that you have metaphors in common. And nowadays, the metaphors we have in common are like ODD and ADHD, and we have mental disorder metaphors in common. But this allows for a different kind of language to have in common. You can both be talking about original personality and form personality and available personality, and each of you can understand what the other person is saying. Okay. At the end, um, let me just say some connecting things, namely, come visit my site to learn more. And if you like, do get my newsletter. Uh, comes out every Sunday, keeps you apprised of the things I'm doing. Uh, I'm always available at my email address, ericmazel at hotmail.com. And let me just say a, a few things about books that may interest you related to what we're chatting about here. And the, the two that I want to mention I'm the lead editor on a series coming out from Ethics International Press, which is a UK press. And the series is called the Ethics International Press Critical Psychology and Critical Psychiatry series. And the first two volumes in that series come out in June. One is called Critiquing the Psychiatric Model. And the other is called Humane Alternatives to the Psychiatric Model. So if what I'm chatting about here interests you, I recommend those two books when they come out. I think, I think they're available for pre-order now and uh, they're, they're worth looking at. 
So thank you for your attention. I'll hand it over to Dawn for any questions and um, good being with you. Thank you, Eric. Absolutely fascinating as usual. I can see thumbs up and people nodding and all the way through, we were, take, we were all taking copious notes. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, there was, a, there was a lot there. Very, very <laughs> interesting concept. Anything, as you say, that helps us communicate with our client and get rid of those labels, those stigmatizing labels has got to be a good mm -hmm. thing. You, you reminded me of Brenny Brown. Um, uh, I, I listened to a talk of hers recently and she said, there's something like 37 emotions that we no longer yeah. refer to. And we just, mm -hmm. they've been whittled down to three, sad, happy, or angry. When they did a poll, those were the three that people came up with and yet there's 37. And I'm sure yep. a lot of them fit under the word depressed. I'm, I'm not um, sure. I'm not sure we're allowed sad anymore. Even I think that that quickly becomes depressed internally. Yeah, yeah, probably. Um, okay, so let's have some questions. So we'll just open the floor while we've got Eric in the hot seat. While you're thinking about your questions or, or jotting them down, um, what you were saying, Eric, kind of reminds me of when you were saying that um, I can't remember exactly what it was that you said, but it made me think of regression therapy. That's why regression therapy is popular. People want to know why they're like the way they are. And is it original? That's you right. Think? And you know, only, only occult systems want, want to try to give an answer, whether it's astrology or some other system that wants to say who you were at birth. Unfortunately, who we are at birth is a mystery, right? It's a mystery. And it's one of those things we can never really understand. I think we have glimmers of intuitions about who we came into the world as, but I think they're only glimmers of intuitions and not the truth of the matter. Mm. So I think that I think that's one place of maturity is not to, in a way it's like, in a funny way, it's like trying to find one's adopt, one's biological parents, the hunger for that, so that we'll know who we really are by virtue of finding out who they were. And we so often, if you do, if you go down that path, you so often discover that that wasn't really useful information, didn't really help you. So I think this is like that. I think original personality is in some ways like who one's biological parents are. Maybe in some ways we allow it to remain mysterious. We, we use it as a concept here and as a sort of a jumping off point, like, well, if I did come into the world X, what might that have meant to me over the course of time, as opposed to really knowing that I came into the world X. So it's a model that has some built-in um, honoring of mystery in it, which most 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 theories of personality want to um, deconstruct everything and g give you an insight into every piece of it. And that's why they avoid talking about original personality because that I think remains mysterious. Okay, thank you. Questions? Just, if there isn't a question yet, let me just say one other thing. Um, as I say, one of the most interesting features of original personality is if you come into the world smart. And it, it's almost not politically, it's politically incorrect to talk about being smart, but some people are. And I've done one book that's out and one book that's coming out on the challenges of being smart. And I think they're very interesting books. One is called Why Smart People Hurt. And the other, which is coming out and I think August is called Why Smart Teens Hurt. And I think we may even be doing a workshop in part of the series about teens down the road. But at any rate, if you um, have, a, have a teen or a grand teen or work with teens, I think this book that's coming out um, explores some new territory. The, the Why Smart Teens Hurt book does some interesting new work. So 
if that's your wheelhouse, if you work with teens or know a teen, I recommend that book. Just parenthetically, one of the beautiful features of that book, Why Smart Teens Hurt, is that I got to do it with my 18-year-old Russian granddaughter, Katya. She helped me understand what the world of 18-year-olds are right at the split second. So it was a great joy to sort of co-author the book with her. Hmm. How many grandchildren do you have, by the way, Eric? Uh, we have five. Five, okay. One, one is so in- All ages, because I know you've got a- that's a right. baby. Yeah. We have an 18 year old in St. Petersburg, a 15 year old in the Amazon jungle in Brazil, and then three who are about an hour away. Mm. And that's what keeps you so young and invested in things like this. You've got yes. lots of case studies right in front of you. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, you, you were brilliant, Eric, bang on time. Uh, so uh, let's just see if there's anything in the chat box, any <laughs> questions. Okay, Julia, Julia, you're free to ask your question if you like, or I can ask it for you. It's entirely up to you. Okay, um, hi, first of all, uh, Eric, thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, and my question is, um, how do we determine, when, when we say someone's original personality, how do we know that it actually is original and not just formed at a very, very early stage? Now, you may have right. I was a little bit late, I'm afraid. Sorry about that. No, no, that's, that's the question. It can't be answered. That's why I think original personality must be treated as mysterious and that we get glimmers or intuitions of it. Even if we saw... what did they used to be called, home, home movies of ourselves at two crawling around and we saw ourselves smiling, that would not mean that we were a smiling person because we still wouldn't know our indwelling style. We wouldn't know who we were inside by virtue of seeing that two-year-old toddling around. So I don't think we know. I don't think we can know how early experiences mold us or create form personality. I think we're playing here with metaphors that are robust metaphors, but that must remain metaphorical because we can't ever know, we can't parse that thing you just said perfectly. And I think that's why psychology wants to stay away from it. That it feels, doesn't feel clean, feels too complicated. And it feels too complicated because it is too complicated. Okay, thank you. Caroline, you're next. I'll just unmute there. Thank you. Um, yeah, again, thank you, Eric. That was brilliant, really interesting. Um, I, I was just, as, as I'm, you know, thinking through questions, thinking it, it probably would require a client to have a pretty high level of self-awareness, right? To, you know, when they're thinking about that question or going back in and, I, I was just trying to link it to the personality, um, you know, the existing personality trait, um, yeah. what do you call them, surveys that are out there, whether it's Briggs yeah, Myers and all that disc. And, yeah. The MMPI and the big five and the this and the that. Yep. Yeah. Those, as you know, those, those are self-reports, which make no, which don't try to make any distinction between original personality and form personality. So, uh, they, they don't really, they're not particularly useful in trying to identify anything about original personality. Nor, yeah, nor could they I mean, really. I remember doing a disc one in, years ago and it, it had your natural and your adaptive and, you know, where there were gaps. And I thought that was interesting because it showed yep. where you were really having to adapt yourself, you know, in an environment. But I don't know. I was just trying to see how linked it is, because if, if a client isn't self-aware, they may struggle with going back to even, you know, who am I really? You know, am I really stiff? I, I, I understand what you're saying about they need to be self-aware, but uh, I guess in my experience, I haven't really I haven't had a, maybe all, <laughs> all my clients are self-aware enough, but I haven't had a client who didn't sort of immediately get that distinction found it interesting. 
had the same questions that you all are having about how do I know what's really original and how do I know what's caused by some one event in childhood or by or by my family household, but they, they run with it. I, 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 they may not have perfect answers for themselves, but they get the general picture. They get that it's interesting. And they get that they get that they get that they may have lifelong challenges that connect to their original personality that they've never addressed this way. So whether all my clients are self-aware or, or whether this is easier to apprehend than you may think, I don't know. But I find that people get this pretty quickly and, and enjoy it. You'll have, to try, you'll have to try it, Caroline, and let us know. Uh, yeah, well, I will. Then. It's, it's, if it, yeah, if it it's takes a degree of self-awareness, smartness, or just right. open curiosity. By, by, the way, by the way, I think this does no harm. <laughs> this is one of this is one of those things. Whether or not it works perfectly with a given client, I don't think it does harm. I, I think it's on it, it's on the yeah. it's on the side of the angels. <laughs> and I think it's language too, because I would you I would use the younger self. You know, what would your younger self be uh -huh. versus your present self? Yeah, so it's a translation mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, and Vicky. You yeah. had you. a, a good you. question about language. Uh, thank you, Caroline. Uh, if you'd like uh, to ask your question, Vicky. Yes, hello, Eric, and thank you very much for such a thought-provoking presentation. Um, I was just wondering, uh, there's a lot to think about, but how do you think we've lost that term personality and all that it entails, and the medical terms have now dominated? When do you think that started to happen? 1950s, it's kind of clear that with the first DSM, the first Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the switch was made based on the super powerful analogy of physical disorder, mental disorder. There's something so powerful about the analogy that by virtue of introducing that phrase mental disorder, we went down a road starting in the 1950s that kind of killed off personality as a word. It's not to say that, that it went away entirely. There are still Jungians, there are still Freudians, there are still people who, who use the word personality. But the medicalization model, that, that model started in the 1950s and has been increasing exponentially. I just saw a number over the last, um, I think it's 20 years, an autism diagnosis has increased not 200%, but 200 fold in that time. All of these, di so, so we, could, we could talk about ADHD, we could talk about any of these diagnostic categories, but every second or third ad on American television is a pharmaceutical ad. I don't know how it is in, in Europe, but uh, Big Pharma has won. They've won the, the, the war of words and they, they They've made us believe that these mental disorders exist. And that's where we are now, dealing with a mental disorder languaging universe. So is anyone, sorry, just to, to respond, is, is, is anyone, you know, in that, in our professions or challenging that with the medical world or? It just reminds no. me a lot. I work, I work in the world of um, theatre and disability, and I can just see parallels between the social model sure. of disability and the medical model of disability. Yeah. That's right. That's right. There is resistance. Mm. Um, there are three groups, three categories of people, um, people in the critical psychology sphere, the critical psych psychiatry sphere, and the anti-psychiatry sphere. Mm. Um, the British Psychological Society, the clin no, let me say that more precisely, the clinical division of the British Psychological Society is on the side of de demolishing the DSM and the ICD. So they are, they are providing resistance. Somebody like Peter Kinderman, who's an interesting guy, who's a former president of the British Psychological Society is on our side. There is a side <laughs> and he's on our side. There's an organization called the ISEPP, International Society for Ethical Psychology and Psychiatry. Uh, there's the Hearing Voices Network for folks who hear voices but don't want to be considered schizophrenic or otherwise 
crazy, etc. So there's, there are lots of resist, small pockets of resistance, but we can't fight big pharma. Agreed. Too many Agreed. people are adopting these labels every day. More people are adopting these labels, especially with COVID and world events and what have you. Mental disorders are increasing. Of course, they're increasing. People are in despair. They're having it, it's clear what's going on, but it's also been an opportunity for big pharma to sell more people on the idea of mental disorders mm -hmm. and the medicalization of this all. So the short answer is there are lots of pockets of resistance, but big pharma is winning. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Okay, Eric, another question, please, this time from Helen. Okay, so I'll ask it for Helen. Um, she says, is formed personality where we go back to for comfort or original? Ah, what an interesting question. Yeah. I suspect that both are true. That is, I suspect that we have self-soothing tactics that are part of our form personality and probably don't serve us very well. And then there probably are brilliant soothing tactics that connect to our original personality that we probably don't go back to often enough because of the stiffness of our form personality. I would need to think about that question a bit more, but I think it's a very interesting question. And I bet we go to both places, but to our form personality more often and uh, more unhappily, so to speak. I love it Thanks. when somebody uh, challenges you to think, Eric, <laughs> to think on something. <laughs> well, see, I, there's probably a whole nother book that just came up there, you know. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, I, by the way, just, just parenthetically, I, I, right at the second, I'm running an artist with appetites group. It's sort of a weight loss group, but looking at appetite as a wonderful thing, as a feature of original personality, as our life force, as mm -hmm. our chi, and just sort of reframing the whole thing around appetite as appetite being wonderful, comma, and then challenging, of course, then we have to deal with it. But we wouldn't want to not have appetites. We... For no. those of you in the existential tradition who read uh, Kafka's short story, The Hunger Artist, that's a beautiful example of a, of a person who has lost all appetite and becomes a circus attraction, starving himself to death. It's a wonderful story in the existential tradition. We want our appetites. Mm. Well, I, I went off somewhere tangentially, but uh, <laughs> I'll come back. <laughs> okay, I think there's somebody else who wants to ask a question, so I'll just keep quiet for a second. Uh, I can't see you, but if you wanted to say something, just unmute yourself. Okay, well, Dawn. yes, Dawn, it's Des here. Um, Eric, listen, hello, Des. Was... Hi, Don. Eric, that was very interesting. Thank you. I'm just wondering in your experience, um, like when you use this model of, of original and formed, for example, um, mm -hmm. how, how far back does a client go? Like if, 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 if you're thinking back to, okay, what's your original personality? You're thinking your original personality as a child. Uh, how, how do they categorize it in their mind? How does the client categorize it? What age do they go back to or what would, how do they frame it? it? It's an interesting question. I, I don't see it as sort of a timeline sort of thing, but as a who we come into the world kind of thing. And I think people have a sense of who they came into the world as, namely smart, introverted, sensitive, that, that is, they have some feelings about the traits or even indwelling style that they came into the world with, as opposed to a timeline sort of way of thinking about it. 
So I think I can't answer your question directly because I, I don't feel it, I don't intuit it as a timeline sort of thing, but rather as a sort of how you came into the world kind of thing. Okay. So it doesn't match those formative seven years where everything is shaped. It's, it's it literally it does not match that, that for me. That, that, that's all formed personality things. Mm -hmm. Even what's happening in the, you know, listening, the mother listening to Mozart while you're in the womb is formed personality to my mind. It's very early mm -hmm. formed personality, but that's for, it's like even before that, but as I say, I can't get, I don't have a handle on timeline energy. It's like- That's very before, Buddhist. <laughs> before anything started imposing itself on you, who are you? <laughs> it, that's so before, sort of... <laughs> Yes, that's interesting. So it's before you, even before you have pictures of yourself as a child. Yes, yes. Oh, absolutely. It's even, it's definitely even before that. Yes, and I don't know when it is exactly, but it's before anything that sort of recognizably us, including the infant who popped out already, because that infant had experiences in the womb. Our daughter, Natalia, had twins, and they had a ton of experiences in the womb, kicking each other, and, you know, baby A and baby B were in different positions, and <laughs> they already had experiences, and they came out different. Mm -hmm. Abigail came out with a super higher energy than Ellie did. You know, they came out different. Mm -hmm. So they already, they, they already had their original personality that was already somewhat formed in the womb. Okay. Okay. Amazing. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Eric has had to leave us. Okay. But he says it's very easy to go back to the known. Um, yeah. That's right. And what, what you're doing and asking us to do is challenge our clients to go back to the original, which is going to take a lot more thinking about. I think it was you, Julia, said that. Um, That's exactly uh, right. Uh, about the self-awareness. Oh, and lots and lots of thank yous saying this has been most interesting, both personally and professionally. Uh, fantastic workshop. I will send you the chat box, Eric, so that you don't miss anything. Thank, thank you. you for challenging us to challenge our clients. And uh, just to give everybody the heads up, the next one, so three of six that Eric and I have booked is on the 8th of June, same time. So put that date in your diary because this is a wonderful series that all dovetails together. So thank you very much, Eric, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.